Hello, gentle viewers. I'm George from Ireland, and behind me is the house where Michael Collins lived in London. Uh, well, just in case you don't know who he was, um, he's best known for being, how, well, the first head of government of the uh, Irish state um, in 1921. So there was no title Taoiseach back then, but he was chairman of the executive council of the provisional government. Uh, so that's equivalent to Taoiseach now, and uh, he's often listed among the Tishi, as in that's prime minister in the English language version. But when we're, even when we're speaking English, we're supposed to say Taoiseach about the uh, um, <clears throat> head of government in the Republic of Ireland. Anyway, so he was born in 1890 at uh, Sam's Cross in West Cork, uh, not far from Clonakilty and Skibbereen. And um, his house uh, still stands, well, it's a shell really, because it was burnt out during the conflict. Uh, around about 1920. Uh, anyway, uh, Collins's father was almost 60 when Michael Collins was born, and he'd been a child during the time of uh, the Great Hunger or the Famine, and Michael Collins's mother was much younger than her husband. Anyway, he was a little boy when his father died, and he had several siblings who were older than him. Uh, so he was a bright boy, but um, at the age of 16 he left school. Very few people stayed on to, at school till, till the age of 18, and uh, tertiary education was um, almost out of the question for most people. Um, so Michael Collins, uh, he joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which was a clandestine organisation. It was a revolutionary outfit, that's why it had to be underground, dedicated to breaking Ireland out of the United Kingdom and forming a republic. So it was obviously a radical organisation flirted with socialism, didn't embrace it as such. It was oath-bound, and um, <clears throat> they had a person who was the centre, as in the leader in each county, a head centre for the whole of it. Now, the IRB, Irish Republican Brotherhood, is um, sometimes called the Fenians, as in they're looking back to ancient Irish mythology, these um, heroic figures who are something like the Knights of the Round Table, who could supposedly leap over rivers and memorise whole uh, uh, books of law, as well as being um, super fighters, things like that. So a rather self-regarding title themselves. I know for loyalists, Fenian is an opprobrious term. It's just an insult used for any Catholic, regardless of political opinions. Um, so the IRB, um, its leadership, sometimes called the Council of Fenians, and the leader being the um, chairman of the Supreme Council of Fenians. So it's confusing. IRB, Fenian, same thing as an organization. Um, so Collins joined the post office, passed the exams to do that. He came over to, here to London to pursue his career, despite being so anti-English. If you really hate England, why on earth would you live here? You could stay in Ireland. He could have moved abroad to the United States or somewhere like that. And lots of people from Cork were going to the United States, Australia, and uh, elsewhere. But anyway, he was here, and a lady who was a stockbroker, so he did quite well for himself. And he was involved in the Gaelic Athletic Association. So the GAA was set up in 1884. Um, and it was founded in Tipperary, I forgot I've got that right, by uh, Mr. Brackett amongst others. And um, Archbishop Croke was also a, a prime mover behind it. That's why there's Croke Park in Dublin as the main GAA stadium. So hurling and Gaelic football have been played for centuries, but they hadn't actually been codified. Remember, the 19th century is a time when people said, well, let's, let's actually write down the rules so we all know what the rules are. Because previously there'd been very wide, very wide variation between how it was played in different counties. But by 1884, because of the railways, people were traveling long distances to play, so they all had to know what the rules were. Um, but the uh, GAA on its own website says that in 1887 it was taken over by the IRB. So um, there were people in the GAA who just were there for the sport, some to socialize mainly, and there were others who were there um, for political reasons. Obviously these can overlap. So it was to promote a, a Gaelic Irish agenda. This is the rise of Gaelic nationalism, the Gaelic revival. So. Um, and being Irish for them was to be understood in, in contradistinction to being English or anything else like Welsh and Scots. So um, there was some debate in the GAA over just how political they should be, but um, uh, Michael Collins definitely believed it must have a radical aspect to it of separatism. And uh, he promoted that rule saying that um, no one who served in the Crown Forces or the Royal Irish Constabulary or was a pensionary, pensioner therefrom was allowed to be a member of the GAA. So. Um, and that was then accepted, and that remained the rule till about the year 2000. Uh, so that was uh, rather spiteful of him. There we are. You would have thought it would be for anyone who wants to play the sport to unite Irish people, not divide them. Uh, so he played in a London GAA team. And then the First World War broke out in 1914. There was talk of conscription being introduced. Initially, it wasn't introduced. Um, eventually, in January 1916, it was brought in, but not for anyone who was Irish, for various reasons. The Home Rule Party threw its weight behind the, uh, the war effort 
remember, um, every MP in Ireland was either a Home Rule Party man or uh, a unionist. There were no, women weren't allowed to be MPs until 1918, of course. Um, but despite um, agitating for the Allied cause, the Home Rule Party said, no, we won't have conscription here in Ireland. They knew that would be quite unpopular. It was fairly unpopular in Great Britain, too. Uh, and so that's, that was that. Ireland was excluded. Now, people who are Irish born but living in Great Britain were also exempt from, from conscription. But there was a heated debate about that, should this exemption be ended. And uh, Michael Collins even considered emigrating to the United States. People from Great Britain were not allowed to emigrate. People from Ireland were. The whole idea was that the, the British government wanted to keep everyone in the British Isles to either join the army, the Royal Navy, or somehow contribute to the war effort. Growing food, driving a train, working in a bullet factory, something. But anyway, um, he didn't emigrate as it happened. So uh, he'd heard through IRB circles that a, a rising was in the offing. So um, in uh, 1916, early 1916, he told his employers he was joining an Irish regiment and left his job. Um, they obviously understood that to mean an Irish regiment of the British Army, of which there were several, like Connacht Rangers, the uh, South Irish Horse, the North Irish Horse, um, the King's Royal Irish Hussars, just for anything, obviously the Irish Guards. Um, uh, the uh, Royal Dublin Fusiliers, the Munster Fusiliers, the Leinster Regiment, I might have forgotten some. Anyway, uh, but this was perhaps a quip at their expense, not realising he was of course in the IRB. So he returned to Ireland, apparently he already had a rifle with him, but managed to take it undetected. Incidentally, gun laws were very lax in those days, um, so it was not illegal to own even military grades firearms. Uh, so uh, there he was in Dublin, he took part in the Easter Rising, and uh, he was very close to Joseph Mary Plunkett, who was dying of tuberculosis at the time, and he had to act more or less as, as Plunkett's walking stick. So had Plunkett not been involved in the Rising and not been executed right afterwards, we never would have heard of him, because he would have died in a couple of months anyway. So he decided to immolate himself on this altar of republicanism. So Collins, he was with some of the other um, uh, Irishmen at the Easter Rising, members of the Irish Volunteers. Remember the IRB and the Irish Volunteers are two separate organisations with overlapping circles of membership. He was a member of both and indeed there's a well-known photo of him in his youth in an Irish volunteer's uniform. Uh, so some of the, the, the contingent there who'd come from England, particularly from the Rising, were in Moore's Lane right behind the GPO were the most reluctant to, to uh, surrender, partly because they felt they might be immediately conscripted into the British Army. Anyway, they did capitulate. It was an ignominious failure for the Republican movement. They had suffered more or less 100% casualties because they'd all surrendered. Um, and they lasted six days. Now, they initially had a numerical advantage. Pretty soon they were at a disadvantage. Um, and they had an attempt at a breakout and they had almost no public support. Um, what else? So then they were in turn sent to Frongoch uh, in Great Britain. And obviously they treated very leniently because they had uh, committed high treason in time of war with this insurrection. And their proclamation had said that they were allies of Germany. They didn't actually use the word Germany. Everybody knew that attempting to import German arms and indeed inviting the German army in, though none of them actually came. And uh, Patrick Pierce proclaimed himself president of the Irish Republic and printed uh, his, uh, his newspaper, Irish War News, in which he lied to his soldiers and told them that the German army had already landed to try and keep them fighting. So obviously if the German army came, they wouldn't have left. And uh, some Irish Republicans even discussed um, having the Kaiser's sixth and youngest son, Prince Joachim, become King of Ireland. Um, probably good that he didn't. He committed suicide in 1920. Uh, anyway, um, within six weeks of the Easter Rising, there were some um, protests in, in, in favour of those in the Rising, and by all accounts, they treated very well at Frongoch, and incredibly, after only eight months, they were released. It's unimaginable that any country would have been so incredibly merciful. So, His Majesty's government has always been very compassionate towards us and always very forgiving of rebels, but of course, they don't get um, uh, an iota of gratitude from the Republican movement for being just so Ruth. So, how did Collins repay this gratitude? His life had been spared. He'd been released after only eight months. Uh, he's obviously started causing trouble again, and the Royal Irish Constabulary, that's the police, kept an eye on him. Um, I won't go into his whole uh, career, but uh, he rose high in the IRA to be director of intelligence and so on, and began killing people, accusing them of spies. So hundreds of people were killed in the 1919 to 21 conflict who were accused of being spies. Perhaps some of them were, I think the great majority of them were not, because uh, if the Crown Forces had anything like that number of spies, uh, then the IRA would have been defeated in short order. And there were often um, wealthy Protestants, as in the people least likely to be in the IRA, who supposedly had this information. What, what, what the Crown Forces needed was obviously agents inside the IRA who could tell them what was really going on, reveal where an arms cache is and things like that. 
and that, that didn't happen. And actually, notably, it was West Cork with the highest number of people killed. So it seemed a bit like a, a witch hunt uh, for these spies who largely were figments of the IRA's own paranoia. And notably, the Belfast Brigade at this time didn't execute a single person as an alleged spy. So there was a spy mania sweeping um, uh, the IRA at the time. Uh, Collins was mostly in Dublin at this time, hiding in plain, plain sight, and said, you just don't act like you have a guilty conscience and then people won't suspect you. And there were, there were lots of checkpoints stopped and they uh, questioned by the Crown Forces allowed to proceed. So that was that. <clears throat> anyway, 1921 came, the 11th of July, the truce was signed and he was sent by de Valera over here to London to negotiate. He stayed on Hans Place, I could film that later, with a Sinn Féin delegation. In 1918, he'd been elected um, a Westminster MP for um, uh, Cork Southwest, and if I got it right, for Armagh South as well. And then this Home Rule Parliament was elected in Ireland in May 1921, uh, and he was elected to that as well. But uh, it was a bizarre election. There were 128 constituencies and 128 candidacies, uh, candidates. So the IRA's intimidation of the um, southern 26 counties was so total, nobody dared stand against them in any of the territorial constituencies. For the Trinity College Dublin ones, a few unionists were returned. So it's a very rich irony, but the only people who ever showed up to the Home Rule Parliament for the south of Ireland were the unionists. Anyway, it was a dead letter by that stage. Public opinion to some extent had moved on, but also not everybody was committed to the Republican cause. By a long shot, the Home Rule Party had revived a little bit, and not everybody wanted the conflict to continue by any means. So he was negotiating here um, with David Lloyd George as the Prime Minister, with uh, Winston Churchill, who was also in the cabinet. Arthur Griffith was here and a few others. Um, de Valera came a couple of times. There was um, McBride, the young Sean McBride, going back and forth uh, to Dublin at weekends, carrying dispatches. He was only, ooh, let me see. He was only about 17 years old at that time. Um, and so finally the treaty was signed in the wee hours of 1921, the 6th of December, 1921. And, um, uh, Lloyd George had, had said, well, of course, you know what the default position is. If negotiations fail, the conflict resumes. Now, the IRA had had a lot of underground people um, before July 1921 who'd come out into the open, who'd blown their cover, and um, the IRA had um, taken over quite a lot of land, so there might have well have been pitched battles, and the IRA would have come off the worse for wear for that. So that was that. Collins felt the country was spent. There'd been a um, a big failed attack on the Customs House in Dublin that they managed to burn it. The IRA had lost several dead and dozens captured at that time. So, yes, Crown Force casualties were increasing in, in July 1921, but so were the IRA's casualties. So some people said they had us dead beat. We could not have lasted another six weeks. I think it was Collins himself said that. Anyway, Collins later wrote to, um, to a friend that uh, he'd signed his own death warrant. Would anybody be satisfied with this? Talking about this 1921 treaty. So he went back to Dublin and um, I think it was, Ers uh, was um, Erskine Childers who said he ought to be immediately arrested and charged with high treason. And de Valera was, um, had a canary about this treaty. Now he was not the most extreme on the anti-treaty side, de Valera. He thought it was a bit too far. Could they have external association with the British Empire? There was um, Cahill Brewer who said that even if we're the last Irishman is lying choking to death on his own blood, he should not uh, agree to come back into the British Empire in order to save himself. Uh, he was that anglophobic. Um, and um, Cahill Brew correctly pointed out that um, if this treaty was accepted, that meant that uh, Ireland was voluntarily uh, deciding to be part of the British Empire. And of course it was accepted. So they didn't take a vote on it significantly before Christmas. They had their recess, they went back to their constituencies, and apparently that was vital. Enough Sinn Féin MPs, they were persuaded that the public opinion was, was, was behind it, that, that people wanted them to vote for it. So then they put it to a vote, and it was won by seven votes. Remember, every single member of Doyle at the time was a Sinn Féiner. The South of Ireland was a one-party state, in effect. Uh, and that was that. And uh, those who were against it were often the female MPs, who were very new, and Erskine Childers. People jokingly called them the Women and Childers Party. Um, and notably, the people who were against it were often the ones who were not fully Irish, like Cahill Brew, call the blighter by his proper name, Charles Burgess. I think he was born in Yorkshire. Um, the uh, Boland brothers, who were, well, born um, Mancunians, although I think they're fully Irish, actually or Erskine Childers, who was born in England as well, if I got that right, was certainly partly English, found to have been high up in the, in the um, Liberal Party. Um, and there might be some more examples. Uh, uh, Robert Briscoe, who uh, was a Jewish Irishman, so people who are more indigenously Irish were more likely to be for it. Okay, Collins had distant uh, Anglo-Norman ancestors. 
Anyway, so there was an election on it, and in the south of Ireland, the pro-treaty candidates got 75% of the vote, but uh, obviously the Republican movement is violently anti-democratic, and the Civil War kicked off in June 1922. Um, now, Sir Henry Wilson had been assassinated shortly before this. He um, was briefly Chief of Imperial General Staff. He was an Irishman as well, one of the most uh, distinguished Irishmen of the era, though uh, we tend to forget him in Ireland. Anyhow, he'd become a security advisor to the new government of Northern Ireland because, of course, um, the Government of Ireland Act 1920 had, had uh, uh, partitioned Ireland and the Unionists had been there to vote for it. Sinn Féiners had not shown up to represent Ireland in Westminster Parliament because they refused to take an oath of loyalty to George V. Anyhow, so July 19, sorry, June 1920, the Parliament of Northern Ireland had been opened by King George V, who'd uh, urged Irishmen to stretch out the hand of forbearance. Um, uh, anyway, um, there was a loyalist terrorist organisation, the Ulster, Ulster Protestant Association, carrying out bestial attacks against the Catholic civil population in the north, and then the IRA was killing uh, Protestant civilians as well in the north. Uh, Collins was sending guns to this. He was breaking the treaty uh, by sending guns to the IRA, fomenting conflict in the north when he's meant to be stopping it. So um, he uh, betrayed every oath he ever took, including to this Irish public, uh, when he agreed to settle for the Irish Free State. So, so Henry Wilson was bumped off and the British government was, was fed up with this. Um, the IRA had split in early 1922. The British army had withdrawn from um, uh, the south of Ireland, but for three places. Uh, that's to say, well, Bear Haven, that's mainly where the Royal Navy was, Loch Swilly and um, Spike Island, uh, just off the coast of Cork. Anyway, um, so uh, in Rory O'Connor, and other anti-treaty IRA men taken over the four courts in Dublin. The Irish Free State Army had been founded, it's now just the Irish Army, had taken over former barracks, barracks would have been evacuated by the British Army. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a um, leading IRA man was, was arrested, and then, so the IRA kidnapped J.J. Ginger O'Connell, an officer in the Irish Army, and there was a standoff, there was an ultimatum, you've got to come out of the four courts and surrender, or we'll open fire and the IRA refused, so Collins ordered the Irish army to open fire with artillery lent by the UK armed forces. Well, I won't go through the um, Civil War too much, but August 1922, he's down in West Cork and having a pint at, I think it was his brother's pub, if not his cousin's, uh, which was obviously outrageous for him to do, drinking on duty, there he is in his uniform. This is not just uh, at a time of peace, this is in a combat zone. There were IRA ambushes all the time. What kind of example was he setting for his men? Anyway, his convoy decided to drive home to Cork, and the word had got out he was down there. De Valera was said to be hiding out in the IRA, uh, because he was a volunteer in the IRA, hiding, hiding out in West Cork. I don't know if that's true, or people have said there was some sort of back channel to negotiation to end the Civil War. Um, as I said, that um, uh, De Valera was one of the more moderate people on the anti-treaty side. But uh, as they passed through Belknap Law, the IRA were there to, uh, to uh, ambush whoever came through, and they'd been there for several hours. I don't think they went there with the specific intent of killing Mike Michael Collins, but uh, they were going to ambush any uh, Free State Army unit they saw, and they did. They opened fire on him, and Michael Collins uh, said, no, we're not going to drive out of this. Let's shoot our way out of it. A very rash decision, because um, the IRA were higher up. They're hidden in bushes and so on. They could easily melt away, whereas if you're going to get out of your car, you expose yourself. Anyway, um, he was um, shot dead very soon. He was the only fatality of that. Who killed him? Some people think it was Sonny O'Neill who died in the 1950s. So that was that. He's taken to Shanakiel Hospital in Cork. Obviously pronounced dead then, but he died probably instantaneously of that bullet to the brain. Um, and he was later shipped to, uh, to Dublin where he had a state funeral. Arthur Griffith had died of exhaustion only 10 days earlier. So Michael Collins is interred at Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. And uh, Churchill, who'd obviously wanted uh, Collins to be hanged um, uh, only just over a year before, had said that uh, he was the gallant leader of a valiant race. Um, you can see um, his, his 75th anniversary of his assassination. I was there at Belknap Roy. You'll see me in the front row wearing an olive green T-shirt. So that's the end of Michael Collins. He died at the age of 31, unmarried. And a lot of people speculate what would he have done? He was going to get married to Kitty Kiernan. and would he have been a military dictator? The blue shirts in the 30s said, oh, he would have been a fascist leader and things like that. He had all sorts of ideas of, to develop us economically. He, he likened us to Denmark as having a fantastic uh, um, agricultural potential and things like that. So really not a man after my own heart. You may have seen the 1996 biopic starring Leon, Liam Neeson in the title role, Michael Collins, which is completely um, hagiographic, but uh, I don't hold him in high regard myself. Um, 
and he's memorialized in his hometown and people gather every 22nd of August at the place where he was assassinated, the mouth of the flowers. So um, his part of Sinn Féin, they call themselves Cumana Gael, as in tribe of the Irish and it's now Fine Gael and so on. So that is Michael Collins, a very impactful figure in Irish history and hard to think he lived just here. There's Shepherd's Bush Road beyond and he mentioned it in some of his letters to his sister Hanny, to whom he was very close. That's enough for now.